Power Armor The Savior of Anchorage The Savior of America And the Savior of your goddamn ass on so many occasions Especially when a death claw is stalking you I think we can all agree that Power Armor in the Fallout universe is a vital part of the gameplay and lore We all have our favorite type We all love the benefits they bring to us And they certainly bring a few Power Armor is a technical masterpiece And I'm sure we'd all love to own our personal one-man tank suit So Today I'm going to ask and hopefully answer a very interesting question. Is it real? Or, well, how close are we to actually creating our very own power armor? To do this, I'll be looking at some very interesting pieces of technology our species has accumulated and perfected over the years. To begin with, we need to look at what power armor does for us, the player. As I mentioned, it provides quite a few benefits. The most obvious ones would be the significant increase in damage resistance, allowing for a much heavier load to be carried on your travels, and a reduction in rad intake. For this video, I'll be focusing in on the T60 armor set, simply because it's my favourite visually. This shouldn't take away from the video too much if it's not yours. The technology mentioned should function the exact same way when talking about other gear, but when discussing energy absorption from bullets, I'll be using the T60 as the example. So, let's take a little look at the damage resistance the power armor can provide when strolling around the wastes. Lore-wise, they are basically tanks that stormed into the Chinese offensive and crushed the majority of the on-ground threat. However, in Fallout 4 they can be taken down with a few simple, but well-placed bullets. As you probably know, in the latest installment, our power armor has separate parts that can be damaged or broken off after a certain threshold is met. So, we need to find out what that threshold is to provide a sufficient real-world example. Don't worry, I'm not going to get all sciencey here, that's Austin Shindig, but for this we'll need to look at how much the power armor can take from a semi-realistic ammunition. Thankfully, with the final expansion, Nuka World, we are reunited with the old AK rifle, but in the form of the handmade rifle. The weapon is designed after the AK line, and in-game, uses the same ammunition as the real-world counterpart can fire, 7.62mm rounds. A paladin wearing T60 armor can take 9 shots from the handmade rifle to the chest plate before it breaks completely and no longer properly protects that region. This isn't too far off some real world gear. Ceramic ballistic vests used in the field, at class type 4, have been known to be able to take about 6 rounds from an AK-47. After that point, it would be a game of chance, depending on the exact point of energy absorption on the ceramic plate. However, this is essentially old hack. We have stronger and lighter gear that our soldiers use today. You may be thinking, what about Kevlar? I've heard that being used in war. You're not wrong, it is a popular source of bullet resistance in certain situations. However, Kevlar is only fully effective at stopping smaller caliber weaponry, like handguns. You'll probably see some SWAT teams wearing it, but it won't protect them too much against the faster traveling and higher penetrating weapons such as the AK line. The new kit on the block is ballistic chest pieces made out of polyethylene. It's only been around and in use for around a decade, but it's slowly invading the limelight and armament wears. Polyethylene armor is made up of dense but flexible plastic-esque microfibers at the molecular level. They are taking over due to their lower weight and improved soldier mobility and slightly higher resistance in comparison to other modern armor pieces. It is supposedly roughly 40% stronger than steel armor plates of the same weight. And guess what? Steel plates can in fact absorb energy from high velocity rounds such as the 7.62mm, even more so than some cases of ceramic body armor. This actually makes sense lore-wise, considering the T60 line, much like its predecessor, the T45, is made up of riveted steel plates. This is, however, unlike the T51 line, which actually uses a plastic composite material, which may or may not be a similar thing to the polyethylene that we are starting to use more and more today. So the chest piece would work to a similar effect of our real world counterpart, however the rest of the body wouldn't have it so easy. Real world body armour just aims to protect your vital organs like your heart, along with usually some sort of groin and head protection as a second priority. Limb armour pieces are usually excessive in the eyes of many military outfits. They weigh the wearer down and reduce mobility vastly, especially with leg pieces. Although the polyethylene armour is much lighter than the likes of metal and even ceramic pieces, it's still not going to be an easy haul when you're fully kitted out in the stuff running for your life from a barrage of stray bullets. This is where the carry weight comes in. As I mentioned near the beginning of the video, the power armor increases the amount of stuff you can haul about. We're able to do this through the use of a sturdy frame that, in-game, is required for the power armor to function. However, before I go fully into the frame, I'd like to discuss a pretty neat piece of gear that will also aid in carrying heavy armor, especially when talking about limb armor. The DARPA Warrior Web, which has in fact been approved by the US Army for use by military units in the future. 
It is a very intriguing piece of tech. Its aim is to distribute the carry weight of a soldier much more efficiently and intelligently. It's almost like a second skin, and I mean that. It's not a terribly thick piece of gear, so much so that the creators have mentioned it was designed to fit underneath regular army overalls or uniforms. Introduced in 2011, the Warrior Web was pitched by Lieutenant Colonel Joe Hitt as a lightweight undersuit to help reduce injuries and fatigue while improving mission performance. In numerous cases, it has been a success for participants, having their carry load been pretty much halved, just down to redistribution through the Warrior Web structure. As of mid-2014 to this date, there has been field tests. In the coming months, there will be more strenuous real-world scenarios that the gear will be pushed to the limit in. So, sure, it's not out in the field right now, but it's something that is a work in progress and it's not like it's going to be short of a few pennies. It's backed by one of the largest institutions on the planet, the fucking US Army. Yeah. As for the armour, we may not need to worry about sticking it all together with some masking tape to the warrior whip, as Hit has mentioned that the human research and engineering section of the army has actually helped assess biomechanics. Along with the NSR deck, otherwise known as the Natick Soldier Research Development and Engineering Centre, are aiding their efforts in integrating soldier equipment such as body armour into the build. Who knows what the possibilities could be when they successfully make some form of integration, but I can see it certainly helping an upcoming large military engagement. Back to the power armour frames themselves. Every power armour suit begins with a frame, and without it, they would be nothing but pieces of metal hanging off your body. The frame is the glue that holds it all together, but more importantly, it allows measly little worms like your player character to function just like normal, whilst being highly protected. So you probably thought that the warrior web would be a heavy hitter, as it can seriously enable our troops to perform better on the field with having a feeling of a lighter load. And you're not wrong, it is. Well, it will be once it's finally completed and exits the testing phase. Something that has been in science fiction for a long time and actually been in reality for a fair bit is the thought of exoskeletons. Back in 2001, the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as DARPA, yep, those guys again, initiated the exoskeleton program, funding over 50 million into multiple project groups under their observation. In 2008, the Raytheon XOS-1 exoskeleton prototype was unveiled to the public eyes, with plans to develop it further and have a Mark II tethered version finished and fully operational by 2015. And sure enough, they have fully operational exoskeletons that some military units are training with right now. The second generation XOS-2 robotic suits uses lighter material and is about 50% more energy efficient than the XOS-1, and is expected to weigh about 95 kilograms which according to a 2010 census is about 20 kilograms more than the average American weights, being about 166 pounds. But remember these troops using them have trained extensively to be able to trek miles upon miles with very heavy gear and weaponry. The designers of the product have publicly mentioned that it has plenty of readjustment options to make sure that the load of the actual exoskeleton does not affect the user too much, stopping them from stumbling during movement periods. This is also to make it even more efficient at carrying heavier loads whilst out in the field. Now, what benefit does the big robotic exoskeleton give you over the slim, subtle and much more comfortable warrior web? You remember how the warrior web half the weight for some soldiers? Well, try cutting your load into 17 slices and picking up just one. Yup, they estimate that the exoskeleton's high pressure hydraulics allow the wearer to lift heavy objects at a ratio of 17 to 1. That means the wearer will only perceive the weight to be a 17th of the actual weight it is. So the US soldiers that have about 70 pounds or 31 kilograms of gear would only feel their base gear to be about, you know, as little as 4 pounds or 1.8 kilograms. That's pretty mad to think about, but that is the future of our soldiers. So with some adjustments in design, we could be seeing a combination of the armour that I mentioned earlier in larger quantities, protecting even more of our body, with the exoskeletons being able to handle the weight and still allowing our troops to run as they would with just the regular gear on. Lastly, let's talk about the radiation reduction. It really depends on the power armour type and if you've got any specific mods attached to your build. They all add a large threshold, being a massive help in our endeavours through radiated places such as the glowing sea. But well, let's face it, if you stood in the glowing sea for enough time, you'd be a pile of mashed potatoes. The ionising radiation we experienced in the Fallout games would struggle to get through very thick layers of steel. I mean nuclear bunkers have thick steel outer walls as a backup to the 3-4 to four feet of dense dirt to protect them. However, some parts of the power armour aren't terribly thick, so scientifically those are the flaws behind them not being able to cancel out radiation completely. But as I said, I'm not invading Austin's territory because I'll know I'll lose, so I won't touch the science here. 
One real world piece of gear that we've been using for many years with advancements involving larger nuclear activity is Demron fabric. Although having a lower radiation protection than lead or steel shielding, it is much more flexible. It basically is a fabric made up of tiny particles of metal based in a polyethylene material. The key part of Denron is how it can allow the wearer to function just like they don't have anything over encumbering them, like an old fashioned lead suit would do. Being lightweight, they won't affect the already heavy load with the previously mentioned armour. And guess what? If you could get a full body suit, you could probably wear this underneath it. So at the end of the day, we have the ability to create something that can function as Fallout's power armour. However, it wouldn't look anywhere near as cool, and it probably wouldn't be able to turn the tide in a battle against the Chinese invasion. But it could protect their troops from gamma radiation and getting shot at by a fair few high-end assault rifles. What does the future hold? Probably much better gear than we see in the Fallout games, but it would be cool to see in our lifetime a one-man tank who can shrug off hordes of bullets. So that was my video on some of the tech behind the power armour in the Fallout series. The answer is fairly positive and we're on our way to protecting our troops completely. I hope you guys have enjoyed and if you did please drop a like, drop a comment and subscribe if you've not done so already. I'd like to apologise to y'all for last week's episode for the minor error which I do feel horrible for. As many of you pointed out the Triton Rebreather has actually been debunked by multiple sources so I apologise for having that as a tech example. However, the science in what I was saying checks out, as well as the technology being there, just not in the small compact form that I mentioned. It was a really cool example that backfired on me, but trust me we do have the tech and have used it on numerous occasions already, just not in that sort of rebreather. Thanks for continuing to watch my stuff, there will be more awesome shit to show off to you all in the future. Anyway, my name is Andrew or Stally111, I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you guys all on another video. And you, you could follow me at Stelly's Militia or Shoddycast at Shoddycast on Twitter. We post stuff. Please follow us. Would you please? See ya. <laughs>